Okay, it's time to see what this suit can do. I hope it can do this. Here goes something. Okay, no pressure, but there are a lot of people watching. Clear the runway. Spider-Man is cleared for take Oh, wow! Oh, no. This might hurt. A, there was a big milestone in our development of this, and this is when we uh, moved from uh, our uh, big pneumatic figures to a uh, half-scale all-electric figure. And then uh, shooting video of that slowed down to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be in alignment with if the figure were full-scale, how fast would it move through the air. And then watching that the video slightly sped down as maybe 70 70 percent or so of the actual speed i, I want to say um uh and shooting that video from up in you know a scissor lift uh at, at the right altitudes and from different angles um without much around to give you a sense of what is the true scale of that figure going through the air um it it to our eyes felt like oh boy this is not different from how a human acrobat would do the same type of pendulum swing and then you know release and do somersaults um, so that was the, the part that gave us a, a great deal of encouragement that the next thing we needed to do was go to a full-size electric figure and move outdoors outside of a building where we had the we had the headroom to uh, launch this robot and get as much airtime as we could out of it so that we could do the, the, the most amount of things in the air to, to hopefully get that breathtaking response. Um, and that's a thing that we sort of also crept up on as we added more power to our launch system. And uh, we realized that there's an altitude above which this feels like we have something that's superhuman. That Tony talked about where uh, it's in the air so long that it feels wrong. It feels like it's feels like it should have come down by now, right? And it's like, it's you're, you're kind of, you're something elemental in your brain is like, mm, something that, something shaped like a person shouldn't be in the air that long. And it, it's, it, it kind of gets a second emotional reaction from you. It's a big reaction when the thing is launched. When the character is launched really fast, you get a big emotional reaction. But then there's this secondary one where it's like, shouldn't it have, you know, turned around and start coming down by now? And that's, if you get above, for us, I think about 55 feet was where we started noticing that. And that was unexpected and really cool. Um, and again, a very much, very much not like something that you can't really put down as a technical specification in a conventional robotic sense, but something that very much popped out of this, like, you know, being really caring a lot about what the human is experiencing. Experienced designer at Walt Disney Imagineering Research and Development, uh, and I'm uh, happy to be working with Morgan on a series of projects over the years. Um, I'm a research scientist uh, at Disney Research, and um, I generally work on uh, robots that are dynamic, that have some uh, some motion to them. Um, and yeah, Tony and I have done a, a few different projects along those lines. Um, since I started in Imagineering. The first question, what distinguishes you from robotics, the traditional robotics? Like when you work in design Imagineer, what differentiates you from traditional robotics engineers? Is there any component that makes you more aware of the design in a different way than what we do in, in traditional robotics? Yeah. Uh, did you want to take that one first, or sure? I'll 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 set it up. Um, okay. <laughs> I think uh, so. So I think I you know I come from uh, uh, my PhD in more conventional robotics, and um, there's definitely I think the focus there is on accomplishing a task. Um, and what's fun about uh, our job here is that our goal is to create a connection or an emotion. 
Um, and so it's different. It's, it's a, it's more about, I'm actually, I'd love for Tony to talk a little bit about this because that's why, um, you have like hard technical skills are really important to achieve something new, but we can't just be task focused. We have to look a little bit more broadly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a, some really fascinating things that are happening in the field of robotics, especially as of late. Um, but we're an entertainment company. And so, uh, our whole world is sort of this, this niche of uh, creating entertainment, things that uh, we think will get big reactions out of our uh, uh, theme park guests. And so that's the thing that always has to be at the forefront of our minds, and that's the focus of our development. Now, we know that we have to leverage um, the latest in uh, robotics uh, advance, uh, advances, and, and we're always trying to work on those ourselves, but it's always in the service of how great of an experience can we make for the people that come to our theme parks? Mm-hmm. So maybe I want to go for the first project that you did together. Can you tell me the first thing you did together and how you build the story? Like you said, it's entertainment. So I think the objective here more, you don't care about the utility aspect as much as how entertaining it is. So can you tell us the first project before going to the Stuntronics and other robots, but maybe the first project how we go for the design? What is the first step that you guys just sit together and think about the design? Ooh, um, uh, there's a lot to that question. Uh, so I'll, I'll start to sort of feel my way around it. <laughs> yeah. And f- feel free to uh, re- redirect uh, direct me on course with that. And I, uh, I'll, Morgan, chime in um, just, uh, you know, wh- whenever. Because this is one of these things where Morgan was doing one thing on in one half of the building and I was doing something over in the other half of the building and um, we just kind of got lucky in that we were sort of put together to work on uh, uh, help each other out for a particular project but what Morgan was doing was actually quite fascinating he was doing serious robotics Uh, do you want to talk about the brick well I think yeah I think actually it might be good to I think what was in common in between was this uh, there was this um uh, wh- wh- where the project started was actually less of like, I don't think uh, anybody had like a, a real show in mind or a really like a, a final destination, but what both of us were working on was around this idea that wouldn't it be neat if the robot was really, f- was actually just flying, like just being thrown across the room. That was, that was the, 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 the kind of the core idea. And I know that, um, when I joined Imagineering, Tony had had this idea of like, can we just take a robot and throw it? And um, he was uh, attacking it from, uh, let's try and make a character without any uh, actuated components so we can actually see if we actually make something character shaped survive an impact. And on my side, I uh, that idea of like, oh my goodness, a, a robot that's flying, it's not, it's not, there's no strings, it's actually thrown in the air, it's up there for some amount of time. Uh, was really exciting and there was this idea we didn't know where it was going to go but it it, it immediately grabbed you emotionally it grabbed me I was like oh that's a cool thing and my uh, my uh, my advisor at the time was uh, also thought it was cool and we both were thinking about well if um, if we were actually up in the air you know how are you going to start controlling that motion so I started doing some experiments around changing the angular uh, changing the uh, inertia of the object so that you could change angular velocity uh, while you're flying and have some kind of control over the final end position of the robot. Um, and so Tony was working on getting a character flying through the air. I was working on doing some of the inertial control and eventually we came together, but we were both, uh, I think we were both pulled in by this idea of, you know, a robot that's, or uh, something that's just flying through the air, um, untethered and, and free. And there's something really compelling about that. And we didn't know exactly where it was going to go, but we knew that that was something that like grabbed our interest, grabbed our imaginations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like it was a sort of new territory for us, uh, given that we, uh, uh, what we do uh, uh, for our robots, our animatronic figures, uh, is that we design them to give these performances in show scenes and, uh, those are very sort of set, uh, set things, set performances. And we're wondering, well, we have all this action that we're seeing on, uh, on the screen in our movies. And so we're wondering, how can we actually capture all that energy 
uh, all that activity, all that action, and, and uh, put that into our theme parks as a physical thing, not as projected media, but as an actual uh, robotic character or as a character. Uh, uh, and nobody needs to know it's a robot, but uh, what would it take to actually uh, sort of pull something like that off? And so we started in the very, very early stages of, well, can we even make a robot that is designed to, uh, to not be tethered and could actually uh, survive an impact? And then that just seemed to open the doors for this flood of, uh, of possibilities. Very interesting. So maybe I want to go for the first iteration. You, you said that you have certain characteristics like fail with grace and also just maybe have some like facial attribute like human, uh, as we see in the Stuntronics. Can you tell us about the story about building the Stuntronics? I, I know that you start with a brick and then go to the, the full humanoid uh, flying robot here. I'm curious about the iteration that could be failed, like for example, for certain constraint, or there is something was counterintuitive to you guys when you try to design the whole thing. Yeah, Morgan, do you, uh, you remember all the yeah. steps that we took? Yeah, I mean, I think there were, it was a series of questions that we were trying to answer. Um, and uh, like it started out like we had, we knew that we could do something that was very simple, that looked roughly like a character. And we knew that we could do this, we could do something more intelligent uh, with this like brick shaped object. But then the question was, could we, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. We, we ultimately, what we thought would be really cool would be a character that was full scale and that could look like a performer, but that could also, uh, do some of this intelligent stuff and control its motion. And what we weren't sure about was uh, there were a lot of unanswered questions there, which were, you know, how, how are you going to throw that? How is it going to survive? How is it going to land? Um, is it, uh, do you, can you even get enough power uh, on board to make it, to make it work? Like it's uh, for, for a, you know, if you're really spinning around doing a tuck can be very power intensive and you don't have that much time in the air, so you have to have a combination of both torque and speed. And uh, there's limitations on what motors can accomplish. So um, we actually spent a lot of time uh, early on trying to just figure out what actuation technique we'd use. So we actually explored significantly, spent a good amount of time exploring pneumatics because we knew we could get a lot of power density out of a pneumatic actuator. Um, and what was maybe surprising is that uh, we also were exploring electric motors. And what we found is that um, it was a lot easier to get the kind of smooth uh, motion that we wanted out of electric motors uh, right off the bat than out of the pneumatics. The pneumatics, the easiest way to use the pneumatics was kind of binaries. And what we found that maybe was a little bit surprising was that um, we needed that, that smoothness added a lot of added life to the character and helped us believe that it was really a performer. Um, and so even though the power density wasn't quite as good with the electric motors as it was with the pneumatics, um, we ended up being pushed that direction because it was so much smoother and more lifelike. Um, and we we're willing to make some sacrifices on the speed of a tuck or, uh, you know, the, the weight of, uh, of the robot itself and, and work, you know, to bring that total do some more serious design work in order to make the electric motors work because it had such a nice effect in the way it made you feel as you were watching the robot and you're able to get these subtle, more expressive motions. Yeah, there was a, there was a big milestone in our development of this. And this is when we uh, moved from uh, our uh, big pneumatic figures to a uh, half scale, all electric figure. And then uh, shooting video of that slowed down to, uh, 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 to, to uh, be in alignment with if the figure were full scale, how fast would it move through the air? And then watching that the video slightly sped down as maybe 70% 70, 70 or so of the actual speed, I, I want to say. Um, uh, and shooting that video from up in you know, a scissor lift uh, at, at the right altitudes and from different angles um, without much around to give you a sense of what is the true scale of that figure going through the air, um, it, it, to our eyes, felt like, oh boy, this is 
not different from how a human acrobat would do a, the same type of pendulum swing and then you know release and do somersaults. Um, so that was the, the part that gave us a, a great deal of encouragement that the next thing we needed to do was go to a full-size electric figure and move outdoors outside of a building where we had the we had the headroom to uh, launch this robot and get as much airtime as we could out of it so that we could do the, mo the, the most amount of things in the air to, to hopefully get that breathtaking response. Um, and that's a thing that we sort of also crept up on as we added more power to our launch system. And uh, we realized that there's an altitude above which this feels like we have something that's superhuman. Yeah, that's actually, sorry, go ahead. No, no, f f f please finish that thought. No, uh, no, I was, I, th I, I'm just excited because that is that's something that was a true surprise for us is that as we were throwing the robot higher and higher, um, there was this moment that Tony talked about where uh, it's in the air so long that it feels wrong. It feels like it's feels like it should have come down by now, right? And it's like it's you're you're kind of you're something elemental in your brain is like mm, something that something shaped like a person shouldn't be in the air that long and it, it's it it kind of gets a second emotional reaction from you it's a big reaction when the thing is launched when the character is launched really fast you get a big emotional reaction but then there's this secondary one where it's like shouldn't it have you know turned around and start coming down by now and that's if you get above for us that was like about 55 feet was where we started noticing that and that was unexpected and really cool um and again a very much very much not like something that you can't really put down as a technical specification in a conventional robotic sense, but something that very much popped out of this, like, you know, being really caring a lot about what the human is experiencing. Go ahead. Is it, you want to say something, Tony? Oh, uh, it's, I think it sort of ties into this, uh, this connection you have with uh, the robot character um, is becomes a feeling of empathy. If you can now relate to, gee, what would happen if I were that, if I, if I were 65 feet in the air, and coming down from that height, there's a there's a thing that makes us all f feel something very powerful, mm. uh, and, and that's sort of uh, we got a taste of that with this uh, with our uh, 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 Spider-Man Centronic figure, and so that has us now thinking in that mode constantly. Where else can we find these these moments that we can do with the performance of a robot? that brings out these very powerful feelings. One other, I just remembered one other kind of surprising thing out of the physics there, which yeah. was when we were, when, as we developed the launch system for the robot, um, what we found out initially was actually kind of a challenge is that the physics of, it's, a, it's kind of, you can kind of think of it as a double pendulum because it's the robot at the end of this rope. Um, and then you also have this uh, rapidly shortening rope and both of those uh, actually create a very sensitive system in terms of small changes in the initial motion of the robot, small changes in the initial conditions of the robot could lead to uh, quite different results in terms of how fast the robot was spinning, a little bit about how far it would go. And so uh, initially that was kind of a challenge because um, it meant that we had to be really consistent with how we uh, set up the robot and meant that um, we had to have a certain level of repeatability in everything that we did. But, and, and, and actually, initially it was kind of um, a little bit daunting because of the, the sensitivity to those conditions. But ultimately, looking back uh, on the flip side of that, because it was so sensitive to, because it was a sensitive system that could have big changes from small motions, that actually ended up being a really powerful tool because we could end up doing from the same robot and almost the exact same uh, launching motion uh, with very small variations, we could have a robot that did, uh, we could have a performance that did a front flip or a double front flip or a single back flip or a double back flip or a triple back flip. And these could all come out of very similar motions from the launch uh, mechanism and produce different results for the acrobatics, which was cool because it suddenly gave us this big range of acrobatic motions that we could make out of a relatively simple uh, launch sequence. And so it was initially a challenge, but um, once we were able to make, once we were able to figure out a way to make it tractable and repeatable, it then gave us this, uh, this greater flexibility to make uh, this greater range of cool um, performances. Mm -hmm.
very interesting. There is many interesting one here, but I want to ask you guys maybe about oh, actuation because at the beginning you mentioned you tried pneumatic and then electric motors like servos here, and it gives this lifeness to the to the, the figure here. Did you guys discuss? I wish we, we wish that we have this kind of actuated like resemble artificial muscle because we know in robotic community we still don't have artificial muscle resemble biological one if we speak about energy and performance and force. Did you have this kind of discussion about the actuation? Yeah, I mean that. Uh, if, if we could have uh, actuators that resemble human muscles that give us the performance of human muscles, um, that that's that's a that's a dream. That's that's the that's the 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 thing that we would uh, uh, would open up everything for us if we if we could have that kind of capability, because when we're building the the kinds of robots uh, we're making with. Uh, the somewhat more sort of conventional styles of actuators, uh, you know, the electric servos, uh, even as uh, as sophisticated as they have become now, uh, there's always the possibility that you're going to back drive something hard enough and you're going to strip gears in a gearbox, uh, or that you're going to hit these these ceilings of how much uh, torque you can get out of a motor. When you when what you also need is torque plus the speed. And so we start hitting these these very you know real world limitations of uh, what's available to us today. So uh, w once we can get some, our hands on something that uh, that uh, matches the the performance and ex exceeds it and gives us uh, a kind of unbreakability or indestructibility to it, then that feels like it'd be the the absolute perfect fit for what we're trying to accomplish with the style of robotics that we are building towards now. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Morgan because he's really the, the person who has been uh, in, in the, the depths of these problems every day. Yeah, I think Tony, po uh, Tony touched on the main points uh, pretty, uh, pretty accurately, which is um, some the uh, power density of a human muscle is pretty great. It's, uh, it's, it, we can get close to that with uh, good motors and some motors can do a little bit better, but it's just a really nice packaging. And it's also uh, some of the things that are, I'm really envious of in terms of the human muscle or, or an animal muscle in general is, uh, as Tony mentioned, the compliance um, so that there's this robustness to impact and, uh, and there's this uh, um, ability to interact with the external world much more gracefully. Um, then the compliance also comes with this great built-in, really robust proprioception where you can tell where the ro where animals and humans do a great job of estimating um, not only where they're commanding the actuator to be, but where it actually is and how much stretch is involved in the tendons and being able to actually estimate where your limbs are uh, in a robust way. Um, and then uh, also the, the beautiful thing about um, human muscles and uh, animal actuators is that you have kind of this infinitely varying range of sizes, um, you know, as opposed to kind of the, the kind of more discrete blocks of models that you get in robotics. And a lot of times as you scale down, you have to change voltage or you change communication protocol. And the, uh, the, the, the actuators um, that humans use can, can go from very small to very large and all use the same communication structure. They can, they don't take, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the same basic, fundamental underlying thing. And, and speaking of communication, that robust network of nerves that both uh, get information from the motor and send commands to the motor that have redundancy and have uh, self-healing. These are all things that like we would love to have, you know, the, the breakdown of communication to the motors, all it takes is one stripped wire, right? Um, and whereas in the, in the natural world, you know, you can lose uh, nerve and that's okay because there's so many redundant pathways to accomplish what you need to accomplish. So there's a lot of things in the natural world that we're just so far away from, um, but that would be would enable so many cool things. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Maybe I want to go again for safety and maybe the for failure sometimes if the mechanism fail. I, I saw that you already have encapsulation for the sensitive parts as we see. How did you choose the material here? Because I think also material selection is maybe critical in the performance overall. So can you tell us more about that? And also the safety component. Do you imagine, I don't know, but just carry a soft robotic or soft element to the outer body? Um, 
Um, well, real quick, I'll touch on uh, the uh, material choice in terms of there's two ways to think about um, mm. the question. So one is how do we protect the robot? Uh, how do we make sure that the, the expensive parts of the robot are uh, protected and that don't, they don't break? Um, and uh, on the, in the Stuntronics project, um, one of the main ways we did that was by introducing uh, sacrificial pieces in the linkages. So there are pieces in the robot that are designed to be the first ones to break. So when something, when there's an extra strong hit or something doesn't go as intended, um, these pieces are designed to break before any of the more expensive pieces do. And they're, they're small 3D printed linkages that uh, are easy to you know grow another one and, and replace. And so it's easy and expensive um, as opposed to like the big expensive motors, if you you know break a gearbox or something, it's uh, a lot harder and more expensive to fix that. So there's that element of safety. Um, but then uh, on the other side of like, ideally we we love uh, you know again we're human centered robotics designers, so we would love to have interactions with the guests, um, and that is another place where some compliance makes a difference, and also the weight of the robot makes a difference. I don't know if um, yeah that. They're, those are both important factors. Yeah. Um, the the one thing I'd, I'd like to add to this is that um, the process we we use for this is very iterative. Um, you know, our, our very first versions of uh, our little indestructible robots, you know, our little 30, 36 inch robots there, we started off just putting, bolting together some T-slot pieces and, and, and sticking actuators on it and we keep have we have kept evolving towards, you know, much more sort of sophisticated designs that are that are using really sort of high tech, uh, uh, printable materials, so that we can get as much strength for as little weight as possible. And the the approach we're taking now is like how how light can we possibly make this robot and and uh, so so that we can get the most animation out of it. Uh, and at the same point though, it can't be so light that it's fragile and it's it's one of those things where when you're talking about interacting with humans um that lightness uh we like it because it it helps the robot not break but it also makes it a lot less scary for a human to interact with it because as the robot becomes lighter then the torques required to move it becomes smaller which means that the torque that the robot could apply on a human goes down and comes down to a place where it's uh, much less scary and intimidating. Um, and uh, and again, this is where it's nice to, uh, this is again, a place where we where we want to imitate uh, human actuators is um, a lot of times conventional robotic actuators, if you don't add some kind of compliance to them, uh, they're hard to back drive. And so they can, they can create pinch points and they can, uh, uh, they can be um, less comfortable to interact with. But if we make the robot light, so it doesn't have a lot of torque, we make it compliant, and that opens up more possibilities for really safely and really safely interacting with human beings. And that hopefully opens up a lot of cool possibilities yeah. for the future. I really like this point. Actually, I recently bunched my spot robot, so I, I, I feel the vein. <laughs> oh. I, 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 I just stressed to the point. And just, I, I want to go back for the embassy point uh, that you said, uh, Tony, and also for the safety for humans to interact. For example, when kids see spot, for example, they feel scared. And I start to feel connection, but I don't know for kids, they feel scared when you see the spot first time compared to other robots. And since we speak about Disney here, I think you guys care about the design, just as you say, not that, that much bench boy and for people or anything. And also the connection and embassy. How you start to make this design the embassy component, and which was really clear in the last robot indestructible, which is really impressive. But yeah. Kate, about, you start drawing what, what is happening at the beginning to get the figure and ensure there's embassy. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great question. It's uh, a, th a thing that we uh, obsess about um, because that's, I think, the key to the connection with the robot is having this empathy. And so w what are the things that, if we step back, what are the things that make you empathetic with anything? And uh, I think the empathy comes from the the flaws and the imperfections uh, in the, the the character you're watching. 
uh, if you have something that's just perfect and precise, uh, how, how are you going to feel about that? How can you relate to that? We are, we are imperfect. We are, we are flawed people. Um, we, uh, many of us uh, know what it's like to, for instance, put on roller skates for the first time and to try to stand up and uh, how, uh, how much anxiety that creates um, because you think you might fall at any moment and you're never, you don't feel like you're ever in control. So we know what that feels like because we have had some similar experience to that growing up. And those, those things seem to have been ingrained uh, in, our, in our minds so that when we see a robot going through that, then it, it helps all of a sudden now turn that from a physical thing of which you can see the, you can see the chassis, you can see the, the wires, you know, you can, you can see the, the motors, you can see all the mechanics of it, but all of a sudden it's doing something that's very, uh, very human in a way that you can profoundly relate to. So that's the thing that we're chasing after because it turns the robot into now a, a character. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, maybe if we're going back to kind of what differentiates us between uh, conventional robotics and, uh, and and the kind of robotics we're trying to do, if you're a lot of times in conventional robotics, you're trying to replicate a task that humans do uh, with competence. Um, and uh, if you look at the two projects that uh, that we're, we're talking about today, there's kind of we're kind of we're kind of uh, explicitly outside that window. We're either trying to do something that humans can't do or, you know, something superhuman and, and crazy, like being thrown through the air, accelerated at uh, uh, some ridiculous amount of Gs and then doing a bunch of flips at 65 feet in the air, something that's really crazy and kind of superhuman. Or we're trying to do, we're trying to chase before you get to competence when you're, when you're learning something and that there's something really relatable about not having it figured out yet and and actively trying to figure it out and so we're we're almost like we're almost it's, it's almost like we're doing the opposite or the 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 anti version of what a conventional robotic is which is to kind of repeat a competent human task where sometimes we're looking for like the 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 new human the 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 vulnerable human who that that pulls you in and that you relate to or the you know the superhuman doing something that you would aspire to um, I think both of those are places where there's a lot of emotional connection and we end up spending a lot of time. Um, if you think about how you traditionally program a robot, it is to, to do the most efficient uh, course of action to get to a goal. Uh, the way we approach a robot is what is the most, uh, the human way of doing it? What's it like to get up from the ground? For instance, something as simple as that. And we'll do that you know, ourselves over and over and over again and film it and then do motion capture with it to start to really understand what these movements are and then try to figure out, okay, it's the journey of trying to figure out how you're going to get up with roller skates on, for instance, that's the human part of it. You don't know, you don't know how you're going to do it. You're going to try a few different things and you're going to look clumsy and you're going to look awkward, but what you're not going to look like is a robot because you're not being efficient about how you're thinking about it. Your approach, if you can sort of get into the mind of a robot, it would, our, these particular robots that we're trying to do would be almost like uh, it's, it doesn't know how to do this. And so it's trying to sort of figure it out and it's not efficient and it has no frame of reference and it's just trying to feel out how it would do it. And sure enough, if you do it, if you approach it that way, it matches what a person would do, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Very interesting. Maybe I want to ask about the question about the when I saw you in the stage, for example, the movement. Is this something? How, how did you the learning to fall over and and just to stir up again and hugging you? I think that was really really impressive and very very smooth. Can it was some? I, I'm just curious about the same thing and actuation and all things here to get this kind of. It was really catch it for us the feeling just to relate to the figure like it's something real. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think the secret there is mainly in uh, in how fast we're able to iterate through different kinds of animations. So we have a system where the robot is really robust. So if you try something out, the robot falls over, it's not a problem. The robot, you just pick it up and, and go right back to work. Very rarely does anything break. Um, and so you have this kind of freedom in how you're designing the animation. And then we have a bunch of people in the loop looking at that animation, and we're also 
We also designed the robot to be fairly modular. So if we want to add a degree of freedom, take away a degree of freedom, this is helping us, this is not helping us. We can do that pretty quickly. And so that system of being able to rapidly change the robot, rapidly try out the animations is where I think a lot of that, uh, where you, how we were able to arrive at something that looked smooth and, and, uh, and empathetic and interesting and human. Because that's, that's where I think the magic is, because the actual robot is really simple and there's almost no sensing going on. Um, we're just recording joint angles. You know, there's, uh, there's not really any autonomy. Um, we're uh, playing back pre-recorded uh, motor positions um, and we've found uh, sequences that are self-stabilizing so that um, we don't have to uh, do complicated balancing or, or really uh, do uh, feedback. We can just run the motion forward and it's uh, in a stable part of the dynamics so that it can happen repeatably. Um, and so if the motion looks good, it's mainly because we have had to develop these uh, these animation we've we've had this style of animation that uh, that lets us move really quickly and and to support that we've also had to develop tools that allow us to really quickly try out new animations change animations and uh, and get things looking uh, mm. the, the way that we want them to look yeah I'd say that was maybe one of the most groundbreaking things that we had learned when we started doing this early on is that if you try to program a robot using the, 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 the standard methods for doing this, you'll almost never get to where we needed to go. We, uh, we realized that we have to have a much faster method for developing animations so that we can try something out, we can tweak it, we can try it again, and we can, in the course of a day, have already developed you know, a few animations that are complex but we did them in a short period of time because we can we can actually iterate that fast and and as soon as we think okay we, you know we, we're using our this tool that our, our our guys on our team had had designed specifically for doing this kind of work we realized that oh well let's add something else because wouldn't it be great to be able to animate this robot in this different way this different process for animation and then uh, uh, our guys will quickly jump on it and work that out and they'll come up with their own and part of it's out of almost necessity like they'll find themselves like hey you know they want to you know one guy will want to work late one night and uh he'll be animating a robot and then realize he can't you know be over here touching you know typing things on his keyboard and holding up this robot with one hand that's almost like a limp noodle you know and then having to just try to move things into position so he'll develop this the a, a tool for being able to uh animate this robot by himself, single-handedly, and then we'll realize, oh, well, that speeds everything up. So let's go ahead and, you know, and 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 work with that, and then something else will come up, and they'll be like, oh, here's another neat way that we can animate because some of it just comes out of necessity. But the bottom line is, we always want to do things as fast as we can because it's this this long track of exploration to find the animations that resonate the most with us. Maybe for the late robot in the truck pool here, are you planning to be releasing for the public audience to interact with, like what we saw on the stage, so like holding? Is this something you really planning to do for public? If just you can clear that. That's always a a, a hope, a goal. Is that the yeah. thing that we develop is something that we can put in front of our guests? Uh, the way our process works in uh, our research and development department is that um, we have this great uh, freedom to. Uh, speculate on what we think might be a really neat uh, guest experience. And then we get to ruminate on that for a while and try different things out and build towards something. But our goal is always to see whether or not what we have thought, what we thought would be the, uh, the really great guest experience truly is one, because it's hard to kind of know until you put something in front of people. So we, uh, our approach is to do play tests. And we, we like to, uh, when you get to a place where we think we're comfortable with, with the design and uh, uh, how well it's working, to put it in front of uh, people and see what they think about it as a, as a test. And those can be, you know, a day, they can be a month. Uh, it all depends on how what we think we'll get uh, the most information from and if we can actually do iterations during a test. Um, beyond that, um, uh, we, we dare not speculate. 
Morgan, you'd like to say something here also about that? No, I just think I think Tony's did a good job of saying that like we uh we our hope is that this uh gets out and entertains people and um you know we're still early phases but certainly the reactions that we got from the south by southwest stage are encouraging and i think that there's something here so we really hope that we get the chance to continue to develop it and that hopefully uh, you know it goes out into the world and, and uh it makes people happy mm -hmm. maybe i want to ask you both do you have any kind of crazy ideas I, i'm just curious when you have this kind of designs that related to maybe the, like the Spider-Man or this figure. Do you have any other ideas like crazy because you say that still there's a lot of uh, imagination for designs or I'm just curious what's in your mind Bulls? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> we have, we have uh, uh, too many at times, you know, because you can only work on so, so much. Um, uh, but yeah, we're, we, uh, we have been working on other projects in the past and uh, for one reason or another, they might not uh, uh, go to the next sort of round of development. Um, it's not because it's not a necessarily a good idea. It just might be due to timing or whatever, uh, or uh, uh, limited resources. Uh, but there's, there's so many things. I mean, our jobs really are to think about what else can we do for our guests in the parks. Uh, how can we create new experiences for them, things that they've never seen before, things that nobody else can do? So, yeah, we're always thinking about these things. Um, we have more ideas than we have time and manpower to uh, to actually uh, uh, get done. It's a high-quality problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, areas that continue to be really interesting to us that we feel like we just barely scratched the surface of, you know, um, the idea of uh, there's so much in uh, in a robot that's being thrown through the air that has all these uh, crazy 3D dynamics of twisting and turning and rotating and flipping. Um, and there's so much there in terms of uh, uh, both the way that the robot is launched and the way that it comes back down. Um, we're super interested in, in, those, in those big dynamic motions. There seems to be a lot of cool stuff to explore there. Um, getting robots to move uh, more dynamically in general, whether it's being thrown or whether it's other kind of human style stunts, tumbling, flipping, running, jumping, all that kind of stuff is super, super interesting, really rich space that is definitely worth exploring. And then on the other hand, just there seems to be this uh, a ton of relatively low hanging fruit in terms of if you have a fairly simple robot um, and your focus isn't on achieving, your focus isn't on the utility, isn't on like achieving a certain task, your focus is on the emotional connection. There's a ton of stuff that you can do that seems to have a really great connection with people. And even even if you're not doing it very well, sometimes that's even better because it, it, it pulls people in, in a different way. So I think there's a ton of stuff to explore there. Um, and then in general, just uh, kind of coming back to some of the themes of that we've talked about, you know, making robots that are that have good power density, that have compliance, that are able to sense their environment and respond appropriately that are maybe more interactive that are uh that are that are safer to be around and to and to um to connect with physically um those are those are things that are also really exciting and interesting so maybe about the creativity and flow of ideas how you both ensure that you have this creativity creativity space to come up with new ideas i'm curious about that process and flow to get where you have achieved well, sure. I think, can I, can I jump ahead. in real quick at the top? I want to say, absolutely. I want to say that um, I think the Tony is the uh, creative lead um, and he does, uh, he has that, uh, he brings the, the re really refined sensibilities to the project. And one thing that I think Tony is also brilliant at is, is pulling creativity out of other people. Um, and he does that by, uh, by being a really le low ego leader and um, allowing good ideas to come from any member of the team, um, uh, whether it's an intern or you know a special effects specialist, or uh, to to make everybody feel like they have a voice in the process is something that I think Tony does really well. And then I'll That's throw it back. Oh, oh gosh, that was that's really nice to say. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I mean, uh, that said, though, if you look up the makeup of our team, especially with Morgan, I mean, he, uh, I don't know if he had introduced himself as a technical lead on the on this project, but that's actually quite a misnomer. Um, if you look at the, uh, the animations of Spider-Man, uh, as that Spider-Man Centronic is flying through the air, those are uh, quite complex and quite, in my opinion, very beautiful and very natural looking. And those were all created by uh, this guy here on the call, Morgan, who has a PhD in mechanical engineering, yet uh, his, his, uh, he has a very refined sense of what should look good and what shouldn't, and doesn't think of r robots as being robots. I think very early on we look at these things as characters, and how do you make this into a character. And it's not particularly easy when you start off with an assemblage of hard parts and servos and electronics. But um, uh, uh, Mor Morgan has a very refined tastes in that. And he, uh, he's really always great to work with, whether it's with me or with a, with a, a live entertainment uh, creative directors. Um, because he he speaks that language, and that goes for the, uh, the other people on our team too. Because when you're when you're working at, for Disney, you can't ever separate yourself from the fact that we are a creative company first and foremost. And what we are always thinking about is the stories and what, how our characters are part of making these uh, the stories feel real to our our audience, our guests. Uh, and since we've you have that mindset and that that gets ingrained into you very early on in your Disney career and it only gets reinforced each project you work on that everybody on our team, whether they're writing code, uh, assembling a robot, um, uh, manufacturing parts, whatever it might be, everybody has the mindset of what will this character become, not what is this robot, how do we make this robot a better robot? Um, so I, I think we're, we're fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Morgan. I totally agree. We're very fortunate. Um, and I'd also say, I think another thing that helps the team, uh, organize is, um, uh, Tony and I have this, uh, guiding idea that like, if what we're doing is delighting us today, then we're probably leading towards something that will delight other people in the future. So we try and, we try and, as a serious business goal, we try to maximize the amount of fun we have um, <laughs> with our robot uh, because we're trying to ultimately produce an experience that people should find, you know, enjoyable and and and, and joyful. And so, if we if that joy doesn't exist in the day to day, the hypothesis is that you won't find it in the final product yeah. either. So, yeah, yeah. A, a wise man once told me, uh, "Your audience can see the joy you had." in making your product. And uh, I absolutely believe it. Um, we have, we have a great time. Um, <laughs> uh, you might, I don't know if you can pick up on this because Morgan's actually being very, very serious and respectful on this call, but um, you're, you're hard pressed to find somebody who has <laughs> a sort of a better sense of humor and who, uh, uh, and who um, is, is uh, as open about it as Morgan. Uh, he has us all in stitches all day long. We just sort of have a great time laughing. And and when we see something that we've done look really impressive to us, we celebrate that. We don't hold that back. We just have a great time. I won't, I won't lie to you. If I'm making this sound like it's a dream job, um, it kind of sort of is. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm so, yeah, I'm so proud of you. I think I, I can tell you how people in the robotic community are just a fan of both of you that seriously. And um, sure, we see that in the in the robots you do. That's something very, very admirable. I don't know if you have any final words like say for people listening or robotic community. Any final words like say? Final words. Um, yeah. I, I would just say that as someone from a conventional robotics background who ended up in, in, in entertainment robotics, I would just say that this is a field where I think it's a place where robotics can make a difference, can can be really fun and really exciting and where you can do really fun, innovative work. But it also just, uh, I think it's something that I think we are just starting to scratch the surface of. And I hope that more people will take a look at this as a place where you can apply um, those hard technical skills that you get in whatever training you got. Um, because I think it's a really 
nice way to use it. Oh gosh, um, it, it's hard to follow Morgan. Uh, he's he's great at wrapping things up, <laughs> but I'll I'll go ahead and and, and just say hey, um, uh, chase in whatever part of robotics that you're involved with, just chase after the thing that brings you joy, um, and don't be afraid to do the unconventional. Because we are so lucky that that is what we are chartered to do. Um, uh, and we're reminded of that every day. But it's, it's easy to lose sight of that um, when you're you know, working real hard in, in your lab at your university or whatever it might be to think that, wait, you know, how, could, could this be an enjoyable thing? Even if it's something that needs to be a task-driven thing, where's... Uh, you got to find the joy in this because it's a it's a very complex field. 